Thank you, thank you all for coming out on this gorgeous afternoon. Um, I know you'd much rather be out in the gardens, getting your hands a little dirty. Um, we appreciate that you came out today. And we would also like to thank C.A. Hiscock. Um, can you please stand if you're here? I know I said, there she is. So um, C.A. had arranged for us to be able to meet in this beautiful facility. It's going to be a little spotty, I think. OK, so C.A., thank you, thank you. Um, she and her partner, Nancy, are taking care of the Memorial Garden out back. So I highly encourage you all to take a tour of it after the meeting is over and see the wonderful work that she has been doing. And again, thank you all for coming out. Um, it's a beautiful facility, and we appreciate CA's efforts to allow us to use it. OK, so without, for, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker this morning, this afternoon, excuse me, um, Cindy Boltz. So Cindy has been a master gardener since 2013, yes. And Cindy, as you all know, was part of the Dallas County Master Gardener Tour, Garden Tour, in 2022. And if you did not get a chance to see her fabulous backyard and all of the Japanese maples that she had back there, you really missed out. So um, maybe if you're really nice to Cindy, she'll give you a personal tour. So she has been collecting Japanese uh, maples she bought her first one in 2001, and she now has 31 in her backyard. So she is going to show us some pictures and teach us about shade gardening. Cindy grew up in New Mexico. Um, she had lived there for quite a while, and then when she was 13 years old, visited her aunt in Oregon and saw how lush and green everything was there, as opposed to the beautiful desert countryside of New Mexico. So the lush green inspired Cindy to get out, get in the garden, and what a fabulous job she has done. Uh, she bought her first, I want to say home, is that right, in 2001? And that's when um, you started your endeavor into Japanese maples and shade gardening. And what a thrill it's been to, to see the outcome of all that work. So without further ado here, uh, please welcome Cindy Boltz, and we're excited to hear what Tex. Yes, what Monica said, sort of. Uh, I, I had a house, two houses, before I got the one in 2001, but where I live now and where the garden tour happened was in, uh, purchased in 2001, and it's in Farmer's Branch. And, and I love when people call and say, can I come over and see your trees? And <laughs> I love it, so don't ever hesitate. Oh, you guys know this routine. We use this when we're visiting other places and tell them about the Dallas County Master Gardeners and how we have uh, a mission to educate the public. Um, this is the, not mine, this is the famous Japanese maple in the Portland Japanese Garden. It's well known, you'll see pictures of it everywhere. I have one that I'm aiming in that direction, uh, but it takes roughly 200 years and so. <laughs> I, I, may, I may not get there anytime soon. Also, I have a disclaimer. Uh, some people would call it an excuse about why I don't have very many natives or um, you who are master naturalists and native plant enthusiasts, please just bear with me. As she said, I grew up in New Mexico where uh, I can't even think of anything that was lush and green. Nothing. Zero. Uh, <laughs> We had um, sunflowers were weeds. The things that you all are running around getting so excited about that are native plants, to me, were weeds. And so I have a hard time with that. We had a food garden, Stephen, uh, and it was uh, child labor. Uh, we had to work in the food garden. And so I'm... You will not see me with a food garden or a lot of natives, mainly because I don't have any su any sun. I have four pecan trees in the backyard and two magnolia trees in the front yard, and those do not uh, welcome flowering plants. I do have um, bees swarming around my leatherleaf mahonia and swarming around my cross vine and uh, visiting the hollies. They like hollies too. And so 
I do have my fair share of bees and a lot of butterflies. Even the last few days have been meandering through. I don't think, is Janet Smith here? I don't think she's here. She wouldn't waste an hour on this for anything because <laughs> <laughs> this is not her cup of tea in any way. <laughs> I just kind of slid down in my seat at the last meeting when she said she had driven by all these ugly houses, ugly yards, and I thought, oh, those with green stuff in them. And uh, <laughs> Anyway, I love her to death. And I caught her, I think, three or four times in a row in a month. Everywhere I went to hear the speaker, it was Janet Smith, and I love listening to her. I wish I aspire to be half what she is. So this is my garden several years ago. The uh, reason I know it's several years ago is because that granddaughter is now almost six feet tall. <laughs> and that my late Lizzie, the border collie, that's the leather leaf mahonia I was talking about. And I, I have a lot of shade plants because of all of this shade. And I've mentioned them here, but I really lean toward hollies uh, because I like a yard that looks green in the wintertime as well as in the summertime. And uh, lately my ajuga has just been a purple matte, beautiful chocolate chip ajuga. Um, Coral is a great plant. Uh, for gardens like mine, it grows happily in the shade. And my azaleas, I have good luck with azaleas because the man at Metro Maples, the previous owner of Metro Maples, taught me how to grow azaleas. And for your information, I never give them extra water. They, my azaleas are happy and they're on their second bloom right now in three months for some reason, encore azaleas. <clears throat> That's some of the shade plants. Lenten roses are so fabulous, gila bores. I've, my sister has just taken up gardening and I, I wanna know if I can put down the hour and a half a day I spend answering questions <laughs> <laughs> in public knowledge, sharing, public knowledge sharing, PKS. I'm telling you this woman is gonna drive me stark raving nuts. <laughs> she, <laughs> she has traveled uh, for the last 20 years. She's a, a psychologist and and her work kept her on the road, a lot of international travel, and she, she spent something like 40 weeks out of the year traveling for the last number of years. And so she didn't have time to do anything in her garden, and her husband, she's out there now buying plants, filling up the car with plants, going to North Haven, finding all these new nurseries. She lives in Fort Worth. Her husband said, we just planted those. She said it was 30 years ago. And, we're, <laughs> and so anyway, she's ripping out a lot of her stuff over in the TCU area of Fort Worth. And, and then she wants me to come over there and see what she's done. So <laughs> she's keeping me busy. Um, so Japanese maples, for those of you who don't have them. Oh, and I don't have 30. Um, I, I don't know when I wrote that biography, but um, there was a man visiting the yard during the tour. And he said, how many Japanese maples? I said, how many do you have? He said, I have 59. I said, oh, I have 58. I have to go get another one. <laughs> well, and I have 60 Japanese maples. And so you would wonder where can a person put that many Japanese maples, but there's always a way. And I've sent an order today to Metro Maples for a Sharps Pygmy. So I'll have 61. They're easy to grow. You can transplant them easily. If you plant it where Next year, you don't think, gosh, I don't know why I put it there. You can move it. They're very shallow root system. It's generally about as wide as the canopy, but it's very shallow. These are some fall colors. Sango kaku is the popular coral bark that you will see at the nurseries oftentimes. Uh, it has, in cold weather, the bark turns red, shrimp red. It's gorgeous, just gorgeous. And, and I always tell people, if you plant a coral bark tree, I like to call it Sangokaku because that's its name, um, plant it out your kitchen, out your house window so you can see it during the winter time because those branches, when they're red, are just incredible. Um, there's an, another one called uh, Binikawa that also has a red uh, branching. It's very similar to Sangokaku. That's a little dragon tears, the red one, and the one in front is Viridis. It's green in the summertime, and this is its fall color. That's looking basically out my kitchen window. That tall orange one is the Sango Kaku. 
when it loses the leaves and when it's cold is when you see all of those beautiful branches in red. The funny looking one to the middle of the left is Shishigashira. Okay, this is in front of my house and that is a fire glow. The tall red one is a fire glow. And when the sun comes through that, there's nothing like it. I've had neighbors say, what, it, what is that tree? It's just, it just glows like there's fire behind it. And the, the bottom one, the yellow one, is Sister Ghost. I'll talk about the Ghost series. There are six or eight of them. Uh, they're reticulated leaves. Uh, you can see the veins in the leaves. And um, that one was so spectacular until I trimmed a branch that I thought looked like this. And then every time I approached my house in my car, I went, good Lord, I've ruined that tree. I just ruined it. So I removed it and put a new one there, um, which, uh, you know, any excuse to run back to Metro Maples and get another Japanese maple, <laughs> fine with me. I don't hesitate. I have a neighbor who's propping one up and trying to keep it alive, and I said, he wanted me to consult. I said, you know, I like to buy new trees, and so I would just probably, if it was in my yard, I'd probably just remove it and put a new one there. And, uh, but if you want to keep it, you can take this whole dead part off and keep this little alive part. And I drove by and see that that's what he's done. And so he's not as eager to run out and buy trees as I am. That's my backyard with leaves. Four pecan trees. Can you, you don't even have any idea. The, <laughs> the leaves that I rake up almost daily and I go back there and throw them in all the beds and uh, try to do the right thing with them. But boy, I'm telling you, I have so many leaves. But the, the color right now is, this is fall, but in the spring, the color is just as vivid. And, and I go to my back door 10 times a day just to look at the colors right now because they're just incredible. Um, the Aconita folium, Boscoop Glory is the reddest red red. It's a beautiful red tree. It's very much like Blood Good, which is sold at the nurseries. I've never seen a Boscoop Glory at the nurseries but it's a, it's a redder red, it's really beautiful. You know Yama was the first one I bought. Keep in mind that most of these trees that you're seeing right now that are 12 and 15 feet tall, I bought in one gallon pots for $25 and they were this tall. And I've been in the house 22 years. And so I probably bought that one 20 years ago, put it in the ground maybe 16 years ago and it's, it's at least 15 feet tall. They adapt well to our clay soil. They're drought tolerant. I don't fertilize them, never fertilize them, unless they're in a pot and for a long period of time. And then it's only a natural fertilizer and very little of it. Good in zones five through nine. I don't care what kind of a shape or size or color you want, there's a Japanese maple for you. If you want a teeny tiny one, I've got four in my yard right now that are literally, I planted them in the soil, but they're less than, a, less than 12 inches tall, all of them. Oh God, I, I just love them. Um, the, uh, they come in reds, greens, golds, variegated. That's the one Mary Kay that I'm trying to turn into the Portland Japanese garden uh, distorted branch or trunks and um, so it, whoever has my house 200 years from now can report back. <laughs> they all like afternoon shade in North Texas. And there's, we were just talking before the meeting, there is a lot of hubbub about the ones that are, can take sun, can take full sun. And, if, and I was reading on uh, mrmaple.com yesterday, good guys, Tim and, Tim and Matt, their brothers, who inherited their father's little, piddly little Japanese maple business in North Carolina, and they've turned it into a multi-million dollar, massive uh, supplier of Japanese maples, mail order and or visit. And you can look up almost any tree there is on mrmaple.com, and they have great descriptions. Um, but they, just yesterday, said these seven trees are good for full sun. Well, they're not good for full sun in Dallas, Texas. I, 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 they can tell me that all day long, and I think I may get to see them in about 10 days, and 
I will be happy to mention that not here. We I had to put a, a uh, shade plant over one of mine last year. The the uh, Shinda Shojo, which should be fairly sun tolerant. So, and they're good for a long time in pots. When we had the Japanese maple tree sale recently, um, I told a lot of people, if you want to just put it in a pot for a couple of years until you decide what you want to do, um, it's, it's perfectly happy. They, many of them, I have one that's been in a pot for almost 20 years. This one. Okay, that's when I first put it in a pot. I, it was already probably... I imagine that plant a tree had to be two years old when I put it in that left pot. That was a little pot. And, oh, it just was so full in the top. And uh, this guy, we there's a group on Facebook called Je Japanese Maples and Conifers. There's another group on Facebook called Texas Japanese Maples and Conifers. And, and we are all getting to be friends. And uh, so this guy put a message. Uh, asking me if that was root ever got root bound and I said no it's perfectly fine well out of curiosity I went out and looked and oh my gosh it was a minute from being complete disaster it the, the roots had filled the pot there was no soil left at all and so I moved it to the next size up and the pot on the right is its fourth pot you don't go up from little to big you go from little to next to next um, because their roots aren't happy if there's too much space in the pot and in the soil. And um, I, one year I thought, I'm going to put that in the ground. It's just so gorgeous. And I wasn't happy with it there because it's such a magnificent thing to look at. It just kind of disappeared when it was planted in the ground. And so I like it in a container. This is the Shishigashira. I was at a nursery that no longer exists, and I think it was at, at Coit and Beltline in a parking lot. There was an Ace Hardware. Do you remember, Cookie? There was this little, almost like a yeah, plant supply place. Oh, oh well, yeah, I haven't seen it in a long time, but I was there, and he had three of these. And I, I was kind of new to Japanese maples, and I wasn't familiar with them. And, and I looked at them, and, and it was winter time, and so it was just the branch, but the branches were very pretty. And so I didn't buy it. I was at Metro Maples a few days later, and I said to Scott, this place over in Dallas has uh, something called a shishigashira. He said, oh, really? I said, yeah. I said, it's got a trunk, a big old fat trunk. I said, they want $75 for it. And he said, how many do they have? <laughs> I said, oh, it's that good. He said, yes, it's that good. And so I dashed back out there and bought it. Well, I planted it in the back of my backyard. And the following spring when the leaves came out, they're teeny tiny chartreuse ruffles. You can't imagine how spectacular those teeny tiny chartreuse ruffles are. And I thought, well, this won't do. I've got to put this up by the gate so I see it all the time when I'm coming and going. So I moved it, and it's been up by the gate ever since. That's the leaf. That makes it look like it's a big leaf. That's no more than an inch from one side of that leaf to the other. You have shrubby with large leaves. You have the aconite folium, which is sometimes sold as dancing peacock. That's a name that people can remember, so I often give it to them when they're saying, what's this one? I want to get one like it. Um, it also, okay, so there are several cultivars that to me look identical. One is Megetsu, one is Aconitifolium, one is Oisami, and Dancing Peacock, maybe even others. But they have this leaf. Okay, so that's the top center that I'm talking about. It's Jewels of Opar, if you're curious, on the bottom left, that screaming yellow chartreuse plant is uh, Jules of Opar. So this is the, uh, another aconitifolium. Th this one's growing a little faster than the other one. There's the fall leaf. It is the orangest of oranges, just beautiful. Um, and any of those varieties that I mentioned have that same color. It's almost a fuzzy leaf. And there it is, and that's my hand behind the leaf. 
the leaf is huge. This is a green, the only upright green leaf Japanese maple. There are lots of green leaf Japanese maples, but none of them are upright, excuse me, upright lace leaf green Japanese maple. There are green Japanese maples by the hundred. There are 3,000 varieties in all, if you didn't know. Probably growing by one or two a week because everybody's got a new one. <clears throat> but this one, the only upright lace leaf green is called Siriu and it grows pretty fast. And, it, and this is in front of the Branch Connection, Senior Center and Farmer's Branch. There's one on each side. I called Pam Smith when I first saw him. I said, do you know if those trees on either side of the door at the Senior Center are Siriu? And she said, let me look. I have, still have the receipts she, when she was working for the city. And uh, she said, yep, they're Siriu. We bought them and she gave me the date. I don't remember, 2002 or something. If you have a place, and it'll take quite a bit of sun. I'm, not, I'm still not going to say full sun, but it will take. This one uh, gets sun until, that's an east-facing wall, and so it gets sun until late afternoon when the shade comes from that. And that's the leaf. The leaf is just beautiful. They're just, you just want to touch them. They're so soft and lacy. That's what the fall color is. Now... This, this is Benny Hime, and when I had the garden tour, when the garden tour was held and my garden was on it, the next morning I was sitting at my computer and I saw a guy run up to my front porch and run away real fast. And I went, what in the heck? And I went out and he had put this gift on my porch. I couldn't believe it with the nicest card. He said, I enjoyed the tour so much yesterday and here's a tree I thought you might enjoy. I got cards. That's a, an amazing thing that happens after you've been on tour. You get the, all this, the people just reach out from all over. It's so nice. I made friends with this woman because she sent me a long letter about how much she enjoyed my garden. Um, so anyway, the, the leaves on Benny Hime are teensy, tiny. You see how almost quarter inch leaves, uh, some of them are. And uh, the tree is this tall, and I suppose it's probably seven or eight years old. It won't ever get any taller than that. Uh, most Japanese maples, by the way, grow an inch a year. So there are some that grow fast, but you can kind of count on an inch a year. And, um, and let's talk about the pronunciation. So we all say Benny Jaime. Benny Jaime this, and Tama Jaime that, and Oto Jaime this, and I was at Metro Maples and Scott was saying Hime, and I said, Hime, it's not Jaime? He said, no, it's Hime. So, I try to always remember, and that's why I put it there, so that as you begin to acquire trees, if you get any of the Jaime's, they're actually Jaime's. <laughs> there it is. And it, that looks like a tree, but it is that tall, 16 inches tall, maybe. Okay, this one, full moon. Uh, there are several other names for it. I can't think but they're green, papery, thin, very thin, beautiful, beautiful palmatifolium leaves. Palmatifolium as opposed to dissectum. They don't have any divisions. They're just a, a palm-like leaf. And so I got that one, brought it home, thought, well, I don't know where I'm gonna put it. I put it out in the middle of the lawn and it came out an hour later and every leaf on it was a potato chip. Ugh. Oh my gosh, they just, but I'll tell you what, they're recoverers and survivors, these trees. They will come back from almost anything. So I quickly got it in the shade, and this is the next year, uh, and I have since taken it out of the pot. And it's not thriving. I don't know that I would ever recommend anybody get one in this part of the country. They're kind of a cooler weather tree. That's my Viridis in the spring. And this tree is, uh, I guess it's 10 feet wide probably and five feet tall. I'm, I'm big on that since I'm kind of, you know, short and uh, wide. So <laughs> I, like, I like trees that are short and wide. Uh, but when you see it in the garden center, typically it's called waterfall. Um, somebody just got one the other day, but um, 
Viridis and waterfall are basically one and the same. Viridis means green, and uh, I think that when they don't know what else to call a green lace leaf, they call it a viridis, but it looks just like waterfall. There's my Tamahime again, the bottom right. Viridis, top left. My azaleas, they're autumn, uh, autumn sangria. Viridis in the fall. There's the coral bark in a good winter in my backyard when it really had the red color. And it might be that way on a Wednesday and not be that way on Thursday. I mean, it just depends on how cold it is. Um, so you've got to grab your phone and snap a picture right quick. That's the same tree with red arrow pointing toward it in the summertime. Uh, Sango kaku in the fall, yellows and golds. Okay, here's my new baby, one of my new babies. Actually, I've bought five or six since I got this one, but my son called me from Denton and said, Mom, there's a brand new little nursery out here by the 288. These poor people, they started selling plants out of a barn behind a freeway where nobody, or a road where nobody could ever see it. But anyway, he said, they have a Japanese maple there with real weeping leaves. And he said, I think it's called a rye. My, my son is such a country boy. He said, I think it's called a rye use and mama. And uh, so I, I said, oh my gosh, a reuse, and I want one so bad, I don't know what to do, and, but I don't have room for it, and I don't have the money for it, and uh, do you know how much it was? He said, no, I don't know, but uh, I said, well, never mind. And so the next day, I called him and said, what was the name of that nursery? And uh, <laughs> he said, well, uh, he, he got the phone number for me, and I called him and said, I understand you have some reuse in Japanese maples, and they said, yeah, we have three of them. And I said, how much are they? And I think they, he said 275, something like that. It's five feet tall. Um, and, and keep in mind that the, the branches you see on the bottom come all the way from the top. It's like a prom dress, like a green palm dress. And so I went out there, played the master gardener discount <laughs> thing, which almost always works. Almost every time I've ever been in a nursery. Which ones do not honor it? I'm trying to think of somebody who doesn't honor it. Green Acres, they don't care. Mm -mm. Redentus doesn't. But most of them give you a little bit of a discount, 5 or 10%. So he did. He gave me, I think, a 10% discount, and I bought the tree. And he and my son shoved it in my Buick Lacrosse. <laughs> I'm telling you how they wedged that thing in there. It was in a, uh, I don't know the size of huge pots, but a big, at least a 15 gallon pot. So I got home and then, now what? I mean, <laughs> I can't get it out. I don't have a single neighbor I trust except Tony Derrick who lives catty corner from me. So I call Tony Derrick and, and uh, he said, well, I'm on vacation in Colorado, <laughs> but I'll be home in two days. And I said, that's fine. <laughs> I'll just leave it in the car for two days and so. <laughs> I did, and it's none the worse. And he uh, he works for the the landscape or the garden department of the city of Farmers Branch. And he said, I think you should put it right there. Um, I don't think I even had an island there at the time. I, I may have had just this walkway. Um, my yard was all green grass when I bought, so at least I have that to pat myself on the back over. I, I have eased out the grass little by little. And so he said, I think you should put it right there. And I said, oh, I was going to put it right here. And he said, well, I don't think it should be there. So he was exactly right. What, uh, listening to people, strangers sometimes is great advice for placement. And I put it there and then planted the ajuga around it. Now, there are two little bitty Japanese maples in there. One of them is a, well, more about the Ryusen. That has spectacular fall color, just spectacular fall color. And so, oh, the red one, kind of tall, is in that same island bed, is called Red Dragon, Japanese maple. Don't buy one. It always has dead branches. It always has dead branches. I took it out of that area and put it <clears throat> behind the Nellie Stevens holly and then forgot about it. I was out there yesterday. I go, well, look at that little champion doing pretty good. And I trimmed some dead stuff off of it, and it's going to be fine, um, they, you know, since they don't mind shade. But also on the left end, where you cannot see it, is a Kunara pygmy. 
pygmy being the key word. I'm thinking pygmy's going to stay pretty small. And that's a little teeny tiny triangle uh, island there. And so I put the, the Canara pygmy in. Six months later, I'm visiting the Arboretum, and I'm looking at this big, beautiful, green, 10 feet tall, 10 feet wide tree, and I get up there. They, and they have the tags where you can't get hold of them at the Arboretum. You almost have to climb over that little fence that you're not supposed to climb over. You get the tag, and it said Kunara Pygmy. I went, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to stay pretty small. So anyway, it's still there. I have to find a place for it. It's just a beautiful, this year, though, it's shooting up already. It's grown four inches in the last month. So this is back to the sister ghost, the one that I, that's a low, an old picture of that one in the front yard that I later mangled. I love to prune. I, that's my trouble is I love to grab the pruning shears and go, this branch doesn't need to be here, but they, they have a reason. But those leaves up close are just incredible. Amber ghost, first ghost, grandma ghost, purple ghost, sister ghost, uncle ghost. I do not yet have Uncle Ghost. I do not want an amber ghost. And I don't like amber colored leaves. I want them to be, go all the way, something or the other. Um, but I have two first ghosts and a purple ghost, thanks to Cynthia saying how beautiful they are. My purple ghost is a little bitty. Um, and the sister ghost, uh, the leaf is just incredible. Oh, the grandma ghost. Be careful if you get a grandma ghost because. I don't know what the deal is, but mine's only this tall, and it's already six feet wide. I put it in the front perennial bed, and it, it won't be long until it has taken over that entire area, so I have to figure out what to do. That's blood good up there in the top left. That one is, um, was three planted in one container, and I got it at Jackson's Home and Garden. And the Oregon grower had put three of them in one container just to see how it worked. I also do not recommend that because for three or four years, I didn't know every year whether all the different ones were going to make it or not. I kind of tied them together once and kind of tried to keep them going. Now they're very happy, and it makes a big, beautiful tree with three trunks. So it's okay now. This is Butterfly. I can't capture a picture of butterfly that does it justice, but it's, um, when I look out my backyard in the spring, it looks like somebody put a four foot tall stick of pink cotton candy out there. It is just Pepto-Bismol pink and so pretty. And why it takes on this orange tone in the photo, I don't know. This is what it looks like in the summer. It's gorgeous, white and green in the summer, just gorgeous. Um, there's one called Yukigomo. I think Barbara bought a Yukigomo one time, and they do not keep the white for some reason. They lose the variegation, and after a while, the whole thing is green. Um, another thing about that is reversion. If you're not familiar with reversion, this one will get some plain green leaves in it. You just pinch them off. And so anytime you have a, a special Japanese maple that picks up, it's like it's not the color it's supposed to be, pinch those off. The other thing is watch, they're all grafted, and so somebody told me in the last few days about one that has a branch that comes from the graft, below the graft line, that she likes, and so she's going to leave it, so she's red and green. And uh, I was opposed, but I, I was at a, on a garden tour with other master gardeners one time, and I'm standing in this yard looking at a tree like that that has red, green. I'm looking at it and studying it, and I look over at the homeowner, and she said, Aldi. She bought it at Aldi. <laughs> <laughs> and she just let it go. And so every time Aldi has Japanese maples, I'm like, eh, I'll pass. <laughs> the, the other thing to think about is when Callaway's has their oftentimes annual spring, Jap all Japanese, or Japanese maples on sale, $29.95. That's a seedling. It is not a cultivar. It's just basically rootstock grown up, and it's not special, but they are wonderful, wonderful trees, and they will grow faster and take more sun, and they're beautiful. They're just beautiful. They have good spring color, good fall color, but 
they're just, collectors want trees that are more special than seedlings, and so I don't. But that's the fire glow. That's the garnet again. Uh, where do you put all those trees? Well, <laughs> this little 10-foot perennial bed, used to be perennials, uh, has a purple ghost, a grandma ghost, a novice shadari. And the uh, grandma ghost, you can't tell it right now, is the light green below the uh, bright and tight cherry laurel and above the boxwoods. And so now this year, it's, like I said, six feet wide. There's my Carex showing off. I love Carex. This is, okay, those leaves are lamb's ear. So there's always room for a Japanese maple. Tuck it in with the lamb's ear. Why not? Just let it lay down. And that's a little ball smith. And it had, for some reason, a, instead of having a spread, it had one branch. And so I just let it lay over the lamb's ear. So how to plant them. If you just acquired one last week in the sale, I probably told you this that day, but the, uh, there's no rush on getting them in the ground. This is not an ideal time to get them in the ground. October is always better to put them in the ground. But if you're going to plant it, um, just dig a hole. Uh, okay, my sister who's learning says, so I need a hole that's twice as wide, right? And I said, well, you know, you can give or take. And I said, I've been known to dig a hole exactly the size of the container and plop it in there. And there's, Japanese maples are so tough, they'll take just about anything. But ideally, I would dig a hole a little deeper than the container root ball. And I would put some pine bark mulch. Lots, I buy lots and lots of shredded pine bark mulch. Lots. I use it constantly. And the trees you buy, the Japanese maples you buy often pine are grown in a sh shredded pine bark mulch. That's, it's just ideal for them, like azaleas, very similar to azaleas. However, these adapt to the clay soil, clay soil, unlike azaleas. I was thinking about our uh, growing up in New Mexico where we never heard the word soil. It was dirt. That was dirt out there. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't have green grass. We didn't have shade trees. We didn't have anything. And so that's why I'm just so in love with a green uh, garden. I didn't ever see it when I was a kid. So I use this azalea mix um, when, I, when I can't find enough pine bark mulch. And I get this at uh, North Haven. Got some yesterday, and it's 15 blasted dollars a bag, which I think is outrageous. But the pine bark mulch that Green Acres is carrying is pretty good. I'm, I'm liking it, Jamasco. So I make my own soil. If I were to repot a Japanese maple, I, I make a, a, a mix. I keep a wheelbarrow full of it in my shed all the time. And it's, you know, a bucket full of this and a handful of perlite and a handful of expanded shale and a little bit of peat moss and, and some compost. Perlite, that pine bark uh, mulch is good, but now I have discovered green acres. <clears throat> Pot sizes, talked about it a little bit ago. Just don't go too big on pot sizes. When you, when you repot one, try to just go up a size instead of. And everybody at the sale, that I said, now are you going to put it in a pot? They'd say yes. And I said, don't go too big. I can't tell you how many people's mouth dropped open. They had this big, beautiful pot at home. They couldn't wait to get home. Put that brand new little bitty tree in this great big pot. And so I said, no, you're going to have to ease up to it. Take it easy there. And leave the root flare showing. You've, I think you're learning that in master gardening class. I think that's where I learned it. But it's particularly important with Japanese maples. And I can slide my hand under that one. I mean, they are happy as can be with a big root flare showing. Not like that. If it looks like a pencil stuck in sand, it's too deep. You need to clear that off a little bit. I, I piled that on there just for photo op. Um, this is spring this year of my little butterfly in the front. See the green leaves in that that I've later pinched off? Tamahime, same ones I've already covered. More of the same. 
That's the purple ghost. You'd think that's a big tree, but it's a foot and a half tall. Um, oh, this foreground is the Kunara pygmy that's this tall. That's going to get as big as this stage. <laughs> and that's the grandma ghost that's going to take over my front yard. These are books that are available. I have loaned one of them to a doctor, and I think I'm going to have to call her and ask if she's going to remember to bring it back. But um, they're great, great books, and they're good picture books. If you want to just look at pictures, it has pictures of 400 varieties out of the 3,000 possible. Um, I have a gardening question. Uh, we're all right here. I would like to answer questions if any of you have any. Go ahead. What is your favorite idiot proof 101? Blood good? Is that one? I mean, blood good, seedling. Seedling is a no fail. Absolutely a no fail, but I, the blood good. And, and most garden centers have blood good. Back there. Oh, on back. Go ahead, John. How many squirrels do you have? Oh, two. Not the bark on your maples? Two. Okay, they have not bothered the bark on my maples for some reason. I do not understand why, but I detest squirrels with a passion <laughs> because I have seen them look at me with polyester hanging out of their mouth from my lawn furniture. They just, and they're just murderous and they dig in the pots. And I have learned that plastic snakes and rubber snakes are a great deterrent. Um, I have 15 or 20 s little snakes that I scatter around and hang on the fence all their little pathways and <laughs> threw one on top of the house. And, and for some reason, in fact, I saw them one morning when I came out like, yeah, get out of here. And two of them took off. And one of them saw the snake on top of the house. And he's like, hurt, can't go there. <laughs> so they, they honestly think it's a real snake. So. Anyway, there's a whole series. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Under four pecan trees, doesn't get much deeper. I mean, they get some. Most of them get pretty good morning sun, but in the, in the front yard. You know, I I think I have some that are in that kind of deep shade. I I'm, I don't. I haven't known of any who died from being in the shade. So give it a try. Um, and, you know, I, I know money is money, but I, I try anything. I can move it later if I don't like it. You know, I just, and sometimes I'll put something here in a container and just let it acclimate and see how it, how it does there. Next question. Yes. Was it in a container? That, yeah, that's the problem. Okay, so if, if you have one in a container, number one, after Three years, always roll it over and pull it out and see if you need to repot it um, because it possibly had was like mine. It was all roots and no soil, you know, and so you, you need to double-check that. And um, I have had small ones, little one-gallon ones, freeze in the wintertime, and so I put, I put them in the garage. But, yeah, I think it... it and lack of water. That Tama made my big potted uh, dwarf, Last summer was drinking one gallon of water per day. I took a gallon pitcher out there every single day and gave it to it. And, it, and so, I mean, they're not, they're not water hogs at all, but in a pot, in a container, if there are lots of roots, they're, they're thirsty in that kind of heat, just like a person would be. Next. Yes, Monica? They, they like open air. And, and I did want to address that. Thank you so much for mentioning it because I have been to estate sales when they have uh, Japanese maple in the backyard where I'm not supposed to go and I go scrolling out the back door <laughs> just to look at their garden. I don't care if they have anything for sale out there. I just want to see the trees. But I, I've seen a numerous weeping red Japanese maples that have never been pruned at all and they're just this big old red mop. I mean, I, I like to see a little bit of the branch structure and I always, always, always have to trim off dead wood on every one of them every spring. There's always dead twigs all over a Japanese maple. It just happens. Mark, I do. I do. If I want to kind of keep it, say I have a two-gallon pot and I, I want to move it to another two-gallon pot or just barely a bigger pot, I, I always, always fluff up the roots, feel them, use my fingers to ruffle through them and and sometimes even run some water through that. 
and then when I put the new soil, and, and if I want to trim it to keep it in, keep it smaller. I mean, that's how bonsais are grown. And so if I want to keep it smaller, I do a little root trim on it. Then I put the new soil in the pot and water that down in there really good because it's, it's hard to get it down all the way through the roots if I've fluffed them up too much. Back row? Well, now, I, I trim them anytime I want, 12 months out of the year if I'm so inclined, I just lop off a branch, but that dead stuff you can trim anytime and should, should trim for the looks of the tree. If it's half a tree, it's like that neighbor of mine, you know, you're gonna, are you gonna be happy with this? <laughs> I like this, so, do, and sometimes they rebalance, yeah, that is a nice Japanese look, you know, so it might be just fine. Okay, anybody else? Oh, yes. No, it's perfectly fine right where it is. If it was still sitting at Metro Maples, it might be in that pot for another year. It's absolutely fine. No, but uh, uh, that's heartbreaking. And, and I just, my heart always breaks for anybody who's lost a gigantic tree that gave them a shade garden. And so uh, one thing I will say is that my blood good, all the leaves on the top that get midday sun are parched at the end of every summer, and it comes back brilliantly in the spring. And at the Arboretum, when I visited one hot summer, I couldn't believe the devastation in those trees. They were just all dry and pitiful and had dead leaves all over them. They're all perfectly fine. And so I'd give it a try for a year or two and be shopping for what you might want to keep. It is, isn't it? My blood good, I mean, I'm not proud to say I have a blood good, but man, it's beautiful this year. Gosh, it's just gorgeous, the color, the red. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Sang Sango Kaku is a good fast grower. That Sango Kaku of mine, the coral bark, is 15 feet tall. Um, let me see what else is a good fast grower. Blood good's pretty fast. I've got one right now called Calico that has grown a foot so far this spring. It's a green one, but it's kind of a yellow green, and I'm looking out back. I, I even put on Facebook to my Japanese maple friends, if anybody's looking for a vivid, bright spot in a dark garden, man, this calico's lit up. It's really gorgeous, and it's growing very fast. Yes, Beverly. given a maple three years ago on the passing of my husband. Mm-hmm. Either one. Do, do you happen to know what cultivar it is? It's a chartreuse, a beautiful chartreuse. I don't know the name of it. Okay. Okay. Yes, um, I have a butterfly, not the one I keep showing you pictures of, but another little teeny tiny butterfly. They're the same age. Two trees, the same age. One of them's two feet tall and one of them's four feet tall. But that little butterfly was never happy, and I moved it three times, and where it is now, it's like, yay, I found my spot. You know, it, it's in real kind of heavy shade, and it really seems to be happy. So Would you I, recommend a pot or another place in the garden? It depends on the size. How tall is it? Well, it was this tall. Yeah. The top branches, uh, I don't know, it was cold or whatever. Yeah. It's beginning to have some wonderful little, little uh, new, leaves new growth. Yeah. Well, if, if the leaves are just in the very first six inches of it, it may be coming from the rootstock and the top of the tree may be dead. And so I'd stick it in a pot for a while and keep an eye on it. And if you need me to come to Richardson and have a look, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, yeah, I, I do that. I do that happily. But Japanese maples have enough leaf stuff going on that you can pretty much tell whether it's alive or dead. I mean, and as soon as those branches turn gray, they're history. Cut them off. I, I do the thumb thing, see if it has any breakage, and if it's going to break, just cut it off. I need to wrap up. I'm going over time. I really enjoyed. You guys were great. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, surprise. We've moved to the, ne to the next slide here. 
Um, the recipient of the Making a Difference Award today is a multi-talented, multitasking master gardener. Gretchen Reynolds is in the class of 2022, and she's equally adept at the administrative aspects of our organization as she is at the physical aspects of gardening. Gretchen is an efficient, kind, and hardworking member of the communications team and where she serves as the co-content manager. Xandra Ferris and Cynthia Jones, who lead the communication team, said that from the start of Master Gardener School in 2022, we knew that Gretchen would be a wonderful Master Gardener. Even before completing her classwork, she accepted the position of content manager for the Dallas County Master Gardener Association communications team. A pivotal role, which is similar to that of an air traffic controller. She orchestrates all of the incoming content, deciding which articles worked best for the website, for the newsletter, um, and how to optimally schedule them. And her many strengths include recruiting and working alongside our dedicated group of writers providing seasonally appropriate horticultural topics and determining the best ways to share them. She works seamlessly with her co-manager, Katherine Heekman, to keep the website current. She engages and in, in aligned with our mission to educate the public on the best horticultural practices. Next time you look at the homepage, know that Gretchen is behind the scenes making it the best that it can be. So they said, Gretchen, we cannot thank you enough. But with all of that glowing uh, report, uh, that's not Gretchen's only significant contribution. For the past several years, she has been dedicated to the Justice Garden Project at Temple Shalom. Uh, the garden boasts 56 beautifully planted raised beds. And uh, at the dedication, Gretchen said the garden will change the landscape around us and create positive change in love, kindness, and dignity. A crowd of over 200 people gathered for the dedication of the garden, including members of U.S. Con Congressman Colin Allred's office, the Dallas City Council, the clergy from the Episcopal School of the Transfiguration, as well as representatives from the North Texas Food Bank and Temple Emanuel's Garden too was represented. So this is a fabulous new garden in our community, and I'd like everyone to congratulate Gretchen for making a difference in both our organization and our community. <laughs> Hello, friends. I'm so glad to see y'all all here today. We have um, something really special and fun to offer you. It is a limited edition t-shirt. The front has the regular Master Gardener logo that you're um, used to seeing, but the back is what's so fun. It has a bumblebee in, in flight, and at the end it says um, worker bee, and that's such a fitting tribute to all hardworking Master Gardeners. We're all worker bees. So they're available for special order. They're $22, and I'm taking orders through um, April the 5th. I can um, take your credit card today and, and sign you up now, or you can um, email me and tell me what size and color you want, and we can do it that way. I can invoice you also. So um, I hope that you will take advantage of that. We also have um, a new shipment of Master Gardener hats in. I'm wearing one, and they are... Um, $22. I forgot to tell you that the t-shirt is also $22, and it is 100% cotton. It's available in small through extra, extra large. Um, it's going to be in by the end of April, and um, we can arrange a pickup um, for you when they get here. I'll let you know when they're in. Also, I am closing out a group of um, Master Gardener t-shirts. They um, are the old logo, and they're a very special bargain. Regularly, they're priced $18, but today or until they're gone, you can buy one for 10 or two for 15. So um, stop by the back desk if you'd like to take advantage of that. Um, we are sold out of mediums and larges, but we do have the other sizes. Good afternoon. How am I good with this? Can you everybody hear me? All right, perfect. All right, well, I want to start out by giving everyone uh, here and those of you that are not here a huge shout out 
um, because of all the great knowledge sharing that has been happening in the last couple of months. Um, as we speak, the Master Gardeners are sharing their horticulture knowledge with 60 homeschool kids at RB1. Uh, they planned and implemented all the activities as well as having taken care of the logistics. Uh, Master Gardeners at Juliet Fowler, they continue to share their knowledge and love for gardening with their residents. Lakewood and Frank Armstrong Elementary are instilling in our children the love for nature in their respective school gardens. A month or so ago, uh, MGs taught a full day of plant propagation. And in May, the Master Gardeners at Raincatchers will be offering an herb class. So a big thank you to all for joining me in fulfilling our mission. Today, I want to review the Approved Opportunities category, which is a work in progress. Um, first off, how can you find this information? If you go to the Dallas Garner, uh, Master Garner Association website and log in under the Members Only page, the Master Garner Resources page will open up. If you click on the bottom link, uh, that will open the page with the list of all approved opportunities. So, um, what can you do at these sites? The emphasis is knowledge sharing. Um, it could be in the form of technical advice or you could organize a gardening class. The key difference between these sites and our gardens, our master gardens, is that they have their own volunteers and many times they have their own funding. So what they need from us is our knowledge. I mentioned that this category is a work in progress because many of them are new gardens. So we are still working on how to incorporate master gardener help in a structured and organized way. In this list, I have highlighted those sites in uh, their bolded um, where we have already worked out a system for you to help. So please note, because I've been getting a lot of questions about this, the Dallas Arboretum is an approved opportunity. It's in this particular category. Um, so everything uh, except for one feature at the Arboretum involves knowledge sharing. So in VMS, you would enter it uh, under the PKS category. So this is how, through the, these approved opportunities, how we're going to expand horticulture knowledge across the county without having to worry about the maintenance of additional gardens. I hope to continue um, spreading across the county. Um, and if you think that I'm a trailblazer, I am not. Harris County Master Gardeners have been expanding their knowledge across Houston this way since 2017. After Hurricane Harvey destroyed all their Master Gardener gardens, they decided to partner with the Parks and, the Par uh, the Parks and Recreation Departments and other organizations to educate in gardens that did not belong to them and that were being maintained by those organizations so that then they could focus on their mission. Um, here in Dallas, we are going to continue having fun, enjoying the love of gardening by maintaining our outdoor classrooms and using them to share our knowledge with our fellow master gardeners and the public. Um, but we also want to make sure that we are expanding our knowledge through these or the, the gardens that I had up there on the screen a few minutes ago or a few seconds ago. Um, I'm think I'm, I'm going to go back just because I want to talk about one more thing. You will notice that that central column says green corridors, partnerships, and cemeteries. Um, and you may be wondering, you know, what, what's going on there. In my view, it is important that we support green corridors, pocket parks, cemeteries, and other similar sites because they are habitats that provide a continuum for biodiversity. We can't expect butterflies, native bees, hummingbirds to appear in our gardens if our gardens are in the middle of an ecological desert. 
More importantly, these corridors are the backbone of one of the earth kind principles. If we want to incorporate integrated pest management into our home and community gardens, we need to make sure that natural predators and parasitoids are present to do their job. But just like pollinators, we can't expect them to fall out from the sky. They need corridors across our large DFW region so they can refuel as they travel from point A to point B. So once again, it is a work in progress, but I'm very optimistic. We have had a fantastic couple of months. Let's keep it up, Dallas County Master Gardeners. Let us help every resident in Dallas County learn and embrace the concept of if you plant it, they will come. This is how we all become the future of conservation. Thank you. I want to talk to you about some opportunities we have. Um, and these are all product knowledge sharing opportunities. So it's a good way to earn your hours. Um, and we have three specific ones coming up. That's that number one up there. Three Earth Days coming up. So on the 20th, the 21st, and the 25th, three separate events. Um, and all you got to do is sit at a table, talk to people about best gardening practices. I'm sorry, I, I tend to use my hands and that's hard holding a microphone, isn't it? <laughs> all you have to do is talk to people uh, about best gardening practices and answer their questions. We'll have some handouts, we'll have some maybe activities. Um, so it'll be an easy, an easy thing to do. So, um, and in a minute I'm gonna give you a QR code if you wanna use that or you can also go to the website and there's a link to a sign up genius for these. So these are three very specific ones. Then you have an opportunity, that's the number two, to come up with your own. This is a create your own event. Um, if you have some farmer's markets in your area or some community gardens, maybe some special events around those gardens, um, you know, other community type events, then you can do your own thing. All we ask is that you just contact me, let me know what you're doing. We can offer you help if you need it. We've got signs and tablecloths and canopies and all kinds of things that you can use if you need it. Um, and then you can sit there and again, talk to people about best gardening practices and share your knowledge. Um, and if we need some more volunteers to help you out, then we can work with you on doing that or you can just you know, get some of your master gardener friends to come with you. Um, and then, last but not least, we need some people to create things for these events that we're doing. So again, we're gonna be sitting at a table talking to people, but we need some things to draw them in. So we need some material to hand out, we need some possibly activities, maybe even some things for kids, depending on the event. Um, so we need people to create those for us. Um, you don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can use some things we already have. You can search our website, find some things. But, and we've got some ideas as part of our um, focus groups that we did, or the, the talking groups that we did. Um, we came up with some good ideas. We got some good ideas from you guys. So um, there are some topics that we have already kind of developed, such as vegetable gardening and um, perennial gardens, shade gardens. How do you grow things in North Texas? You know, especially for people that are new here. So things like that, we can have printed material that we can share with people and or signs, activities that will help draw people to us so that we're not just sitting there staring at people. So we need people to help create those. So if you don't want to go out and talk to anybody, <laughs> if that's not your thing, um, then you can help with this. You know, you can help create this. Okay, so. If you want to be a part of any of these opportunities, um, you can reach out to me. This is the email that you can use. It's um, outreach at dm, I'm sorry, dallasmga.com. So you can just email that um, and you can either ask questions or volunteer. And then the sign up genius is available for the three events that I talked about. Um, so, and along with more details. So you can use any of those QR codes too to get to that sign up genius. So we have 51 days, 51 days to go until the garden tour. So, so exciting to be able to share our, our beautiful gardens 
um, our knowledge, um, you know, best horticultural practices with the public. I mean, that is really what the goal of the garden tour is. So it's very exciting, but it's coming up very, very quickly. So Saturday, May 18th, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., rain or shine, we all need to be there. So we do have, so the pictures you see here are from the Bath House Cultural Center at White Rock Lake. So this is one of the gardens that are on the tour. And if you haven't had the pleasure to be out there, it's just a, it's a beautiful space right there with the, with the lake and all the pollinators that Janet D. Smith has put together and her team. It's beautiful. So several things on this. We do have, um, if you go to the Dallas County Master Gardener Dot org website, you will, if you click on the garden tour logo, it'll take you to the tour information. There's a sneak peek out there. You can buy tickets. And um, so I encourage you to go out and look at, look at the, um, the website to, to get all of the information on the tour, okay? And as far as publicity goes, um, Christy, and Christy and Chris will be in the back we do have our, this is upside down, I'm not going to try to turn it right side up, but we have yard signs, we also have mini flyers, and we have larger flyers that can go out to local businesses. Um, the signs can go in your, in your front yard or anyone else's front yard. So if you have a high visibility um, res home and you want to take one of these signs, or actually if any of the project leaders are here for any of our projects, demo gardens, We'd love to have the, these signs out at each of the gardens. So if you stop by and pick up one of the signs for those also. And if you have any local businesses you want to take a flyer out to, um, Starbucks, any of the Starbucks around, you know, they have the message boards, local restaurants, the garden centers. Um, feel free to take, take flyers with you to pass around. But as far as um, the tour goes, it's going to be a very fun but informative day. We do have a lot of educators that will be out there these are some of the, the ones that we have scheduled so far. And we will also have demonstrations, we'll have hands-on learning, as well as the speakers, um, also tours with information, or tables with information, all kinds of fun stuff. So it, it'll just be a great day for everybody. I do want to encourage everybody to buy tickets. So show of hands, how many folks have bought a ticket so far? Okay, very good. Awesome, thank you all. So, encourage everybody in here to go out and buy a ticket for the garden tour. Buy them for your family. Um, send the link, there's, you know, if you send the link from the website on to your friends and family, they can very easily just click on it, it'll take them right to the, the garden tour part of the website. So, I encourage you to spread the word so we can have a, just a really good tour. This is our largest fundraiser of the year. And, or actually every two years we have this garden tour. So it's our largest fundraiser. So we've got to, to make the most of it and bring in as much, you know, we wanted to spread the knowledge and do all of that, but we also need to make money off of it too. So that's the other piece of it. Um, so the ticket, tickets are $18 prior to the event, $22 at the door. Um, if you have any questions on the educators, Margaret Haneski is our education chair, and so feel free to, to contact her. And then the other thing that I have are, um, the next slides are sneak peeks of pictures from the gardens. Um, they are just beautiful. There's a, just a wide variety of different types of gardens. We've got shade, we have sun, we've got terraces, we've got swimming pools, we've got gardens that are along creek beds, gardens that are along um, the uh, White Rock Lake Park that you know, enhance the habitat that's around them. Um, we've got, you know, all kinds of uses of different types of sheds, alleyways, lots of alleyway gardens, people using space in the best way they can. Um, lo lots of pollinators, native plants, adapted plants. So come out and see it because these, the gardens are beautiful. And, so, and in the summer, when we get to May, there'll be a, even a lot more color out in these gardens. So. Um, Feel free on your way out, please stop by if you would like to take any signs. We're at, we are asking people to sign up if you take either a yard sign or any of the flyers and let us know where you're gonna take them so that we'll know where we're spread. And we do wanna spread out and, and publicize this all over Dallas County. So wherever you're at in the county, even though the tour is located in East Dallas, we, you know, we, 
we, we uh, are the Dallas County Master Gardeners, so we definitely want to attract everybody. Keep an eye out for the Mark Your Calendar for information on everything, as well as Facebook. Um, there's a lot of information out there, and hopefully you're enjoying Alan Risner's articles on the gardens. He's highlighting each garden, and they're either on the Dallas, or on our, our website, or on the, the No Grow and Go <laughs> monthly magazine. So watch out for those two. And that's it. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Elaine. All right, now for the giveaway. Everyone had their raffle tickets ready. And thank you to Roseanne and um, the Texas Discovery Garden for the plants. Next month's meeting will be at Brookhaven. So we'll see you all then. <laughs>